Okay, probably you don't though. But we're in Habakkuk chapter three. I really want to be uh, just mentioned again. I'm grateful for all the young people we have on Sunday night at our church. What a great group! And I've got a little challenge for you this week. I'm going to so for next Sunday. There's going to be a stack next Sunday night on the back table there of uh, sermon notes for you to grab and then to fill out. There'll be some questions on it. You can do throughout the message. And uh, if you if you take those sermon notes and you take notes while you listen to the preaching and bring them to me, there will be fabulous trips and prizes and all kinds of things. So maybe just prizes, but it uh, depends on what I can squeeze out of our deacons. We'll see what they can give us and, and to be a help there. But I want to encourage you, uh, young people, to be, uh, you, you listen so well, and I'm grateful for it. Habakkuk chapter 3, I agree, and I think we all agree, that America is in trouble. Uh, evil is running rampant in our world. And, and I have to confess that I constantly have to remind myself that politics is not the answer. Because I like politics. Politics is, uh, I enjoy reading about it. I like, uh, I like the back and forth. And, and I, ju I just enjoy politics. I've never been into sports that much. My uh, Super Bowl are elections. And so I like, I like politics and getting involved in that. But if uh, you are putting your hopes in Washington, D.C., you will be sorely disappointed, as we have been over and over. I read somewhere that you lose eight pounds. This is one, uh, this is one of Pastor Forsberg's little facts, probably. You can use this. You lose eight pounds of dead skin a year. That's why it takes us 25 years to lose a congressman. It's only eight pounds of dead skin a year. It's kind of gross, isn't it? But uh, when I was uh, way back many moons ago, I was selling vacuum cleaners. Um, and uh, one, one of the things that we had an attachment that cleaned mattresses, and one of the facts that I used to give to people, and it's true, a mattress will gain half its own weight in five years in dead skin cells. Yeah. Think about that the next time you stay at a hotel, okay? You're, you're on a lot of other people. That's great to think about, isn't it? The government, <clears throat> the government primarily is about perpetuating their own power. When people get voted into office, they're often much more concerned about keeping that position than they are about what they're really supposed to be doing and fixing people's problems. And uh, it, the government really is more about take, take, take than... Uh, work and, and give uh, for the folks they're supposed to represent. Uh, the doorbell rang and a man answered it, and there stand a kid. Uh, he was dressed in a suit, just a little kid, but he was dressed in a suit, and he had a bucket, and he said, trick or treat. It was Halloween. The man asked the kid what he's dressed up for for Halloween. And the kid says, I'm dressed like I'm from the government. And then he takes 28% of the man's candy, and he doesn't even say thank you. That's kind of what the government does to us, don't they? They take, 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 and uh, they're not the answer. They're not going to be the solution to our problems. We know that eventually things will get worse and worse. I mean, we, we like when there's, uh, there's a return to morality. We like when we see promise of, of different directions in our nation, but eventually things are going to get worse. Second Timothy 3.13 but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. It's not going to get better, folks. If you read the Bible, you'll see that it's only uh, humankind is only going to go further and further down the path of sin until the Lord returns and sets these things right. So in the meantime, Jesus must be glorified in our lives. We desperately need the Holy Spirit uh, to lead, guide, and direct us. And we need, need to pray for God's mercy while we can. There is a time when judgment comes. Sooner or later, we will face the consequences of the choices we have made. Last week, if you remember, in, in Habakkuk, we talked about choices and the results of those choices. And uh, this is true for nations, it is true for families, and it is true for individuals as well. You cannot mock God forever. You cannot ignore Him or pretend that He isn't there. You cannot forever... Uh, do as you please without inviting judgment from on high. There is a time that judgment comes. Now, this is what's happening in the book of Habakkuk. Uh, God has told him clearly that judgment is coming. And just to catch you up, a little bit of review. Chapter 1, we hear, we saw about 
uh, how judgment is going to come. And Habakkuk, to his shock and horror, finds out that God is going to send judgment to Israel. He's going to do it from the Babylonians. And this just confuses Habakkuk. How can God use really, really, really wicked people to judge kind of bad people? So yes, Israel was making some mistakes and they were doing some wrong. They were making some bad choices, but they were nowhere as bad as the Babylonians. And now they're going to, God's going to use the Babylonians to judge Israel. And this really bothered Habakkuk. And he's been having this back and forth with God ever since as we've been working through it. Now, when we come to Habakkuk chapter 3, uh, we turn a corner and the whole tone of the book changes. We move from confusion to clarity. And we move from fear to faith. I want to read a few verses, but we're really going to touch on most of them going through. I think I'm going to do the first three and then the last three verses of the chapter. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet upon Shaganoth, the O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known. In wrath, remember mercy. Oh, that's a prayer we all need, isn't it? In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Teman and the Holy One from the Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. Now look at verse number 17. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, and the labor of the olive shall fail, the field shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, there shall be no herd in the stalls. This is a bad, bad, bad situation that he's describing. Look at verse 18. Yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like hinds' feet. And he will make me to walk upon high places to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. Tonight I don't want to talk to you about when you feel like quitting. When you feel like quitting. I think every single one of us have had times in our life when we feel like quitting. Maybe it's quitting a job. Maybe it's quitting on God. Maybe it's just quitting a relationship or whatever it is. We feel like quitting. But tonight, specifically in our relationship with the Lord, what do we do when we just feel like throwing in the towel, feel like quitting? Let's pray. Ask God, help us now, Lord, if you would. Uh, as we have read your word, we pray that you'd bless it, use it. Verses that we read, help it, Lord, as we have promised that it will not return void, use it in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. What I want you to see that's so important is that nothing has changed in Habakkuk's situation. His circumstances are still the same. Israel's still going to be judged. Babylon is still going to be the ones to do it. It's going to be a terrible time upcoming. He has found all these, he's heard all this bad news in Habakkuk 1 and 2. But Habakkuk 3 is full of good news. Uh, the book ends on a note of hope and of praise. And I want to look at how this prophet moved from worry and fear to a place of confidence, joy, and praise. Again, nothing around him has changed. It is what is inside him that's changing. And this is really fascinating to me because so much of how we live and so much of our attitude is reflected from our circumstances. Uh, the, the, the things that are going on in our life, we are living on, under... You ever, you ever ask somebody how they're doing and say, fine, under the circumstances? I always I hear that and say, what are you doing under the circumstances? Who wants to be under circumstances? Get on top of them. Get, you know, we want to get victory over that. All of us have bad circumstances in front of us once in a while. And so nothing has changed around him. The people are still mocking God. Violence still fills the streets. The Babylonians are still coming. <clears throat> or outwardly, everything is just as messed up as it was in the beginning. Nothing has changed on the outside Yet Habakkuk has changed on the inside. How did that happen? Chapter 3 gives the answer. The outline is very simple. Habakkuk 3 contains three things I want to look at tonight. A prayer, a vision, and a testimony. Let's look at them one at a time. Look at the prayer, verse number 2. O Lord, I have heard thy speech, and was afraid, O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years make known in wrath. Remember mercy. In the face of impending calamity, he prays for God's power and God's mercy in the midst of judgment. It's as if he says, Lord, I know bad times are coming. 
But please, Lord, in those bad times, remember mercy. Have mercy while the judgment is even coming. Now, that is a biblical prayer, and it's honest. It's desperate. It, it's the kind of prayer that God will answer. Notice that he asks God to do again in his day what he has done in the past. Twice, he says, in the midst of the years. That is another way of saying in our time. He recognizes the things that God has done for them in the past. Do it again in our time, he says to the Lord. Do it again now. Do, uh, there ought, this ought to be the prayer of every thoughtful Christian at this moment of history right now. We read about the great revivals of the past. I don't know if you ever read about those, but as we read of those revivals, do it again should be our prayer. I read about the first great awakening and the second great awakening, the Welsh revival. And you read those stories. I don't know if you've ever read much about them, but it almost looks, it feels like you're reading stories from another planet. Like it could never possibly happen in our day. Uh, it's easy to have that kind of doubt when we consider our current situation. But we will, if you'll ever notice in history, revivals usually come in very desperate times. Can you point to the Bible and show me a miracle that was not uh, in the center or the middle or the result of a very desperate time? And to the impotent man in John 5, the Bible says he had been like that for many, many years. And Jesus says, wilt thou be made whole? Whew, what a question. He'd been waiting for that his whole life. And he, he answered, if you remember, he answered, you know, it would be nice, I guess, if it's not a big deal. And, you know, he didn't say that at all. He was desperate. And he wanted to, uh, go ahead, dear, that, that's fine. A little issue there. So everybody look my way. I have to look at her. It's okay. <laughs> Those things happen. But uh, he was desperate to be made whole. He had uh, for years begged to be able to be taken into the water and something to be done for him. And God's power usually comes in the middle of dire straits in our lives. Now, if that's true, then I would say we're in a great place to have revival right now, wouldn't you say? Because we are in dire straits in our nation and in our culture. There's a lot of uh, uncertainty going on. And revival is a work of God. Fire comes from above. It is not something we can manufacture. Sure, we can put the kindling in place. We can set the table for it. But revival is a work in our hearts that God brings. I think the best prayer for revival is, Lord, change the world, but begin, I pray, with me. Because revival starts with me. Revival starts with you in your family. It starts within you, and then it can spread to others. My greatest challenge of my life when it comes to holiness is that strikingly handsome man in my mirror. I taped a picture of somebody else up there. That's why. No, I'm just kidding. But that, that's where it starts, isn't it? It starts with the person we see reflected in the mirror looking bad at, back at us every morning. That's where revival must begin. So there was a prayer in verse 2. And then there was a vision. After his prayer, Habakkuk has a vision of God. Now, a fancy word for this is a theophany, an appearance of God on the earth. So God revealed himself to Habakkuk in something like a dream or vision, and he recorded this experience in verse 3 through verse 15. Look at verse 4, and his brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand, and there was a, a height, and there was the hiding of his power. Before him went the pestilence, and burning coals went forth at his feet. He stood and measured the earth. He beheld and drove asunder the nations. The everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways were everlasting. In other words, he saw the power, the glory, the majesty of God. And he revealed himself. Now, knowing that his nation faces imminent judgment, Habakkuk basically prays, Lord, do something. And this vision of God is his answer. The vision reminded him who God was. And it showed him God's power. I, I think it's, it's such a great principle here. If we get a good glimpse of who God is, we could be able to sleep at night. We'll be able to have peace in the midst of turmoil. We'll be able to deal with the struggles of life that come at us if we recognize who he is. So God's answer to Habakkuk's problem was, let me just show you who I am. Let me show you my power. 
And uh, he talked about the Exodus. He talked about the time in the wilderness, the crossing of the Red Sea. This was a period in which God had worked these spectacular miracles. And by recounting all of this, God is essentially saying, have you forgotten what I've done for you in the past? And friends, if he did it before, he can do it again. Amen. And that's the point he's trying to make there. Sometimes you read the Bible. And I don't know if you're like me, but I see some of these things. And sometimes I wonder, you know, secretly, you know, because we wouldn't question God audibly. Can God really do that again? Can he really bring a revival again? We, we just got finished on Wednesday night going through Jonah. Man, could God really, uh, could, could he really work a revival like he did in Nineveh? Like he did for Jonah? And here's the answer. He's God. And yes, he can. He can make these things happen. He's still the same God. We serve the same God that Abraham worshipped and Moses worshipped. We ser serve the same God that the apostles worshipped and who did all those great and mighty works through them. In Psalm 78, there's a whole list of things that God did for the Israelites. It says in verse 12, Marvelous things did He in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt. Verse 13, it says he divided the sea and caused them to pass through. Verse 14, he led them with a cloud and with a fire uh, at night with a light of fire. Verse 16, he brought streams also out of the rock and caused water to run down like rivers. And then in verse 19, in light of all that God had done for them, they asked a very faithless question. In verse 19 of Psalm 78, Yea, they spoke against God and said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? The entire attitude of their heart is summed up in the first two words. Can God? After all he had done to demonstrate how he's taken care of them, they asked the question, can God? And they needed a lesson in trust. When they asked that question, they're doubting everything about the Lord. And listen, we're a lot like Israel. We often ask the question, can God? We might not do it audibly, but we do it in our spirit. Instead of trusting God and living by faith, we worry and we fret. Does any, you don't have to raise your hand, by the way, but does anybody have an issue with worry? I, I, I think some of us do. Worry is a, is a, it's faith in reverse. Worry, George Mueller said, is a mild form of atheism. Worry will keep you busy, but it won't take you anywhere. It's like sitting in a rocking chair. It give you something to do, but it just won't take you anywhere. It won't do anything for you. Worry is, uh, is, a, is a killer of our Christian service to the Lord. And so this shows that they're worried. And it doesn't have to be that way because I want to tell you, we have a God in whom we can trust with no reservation because God can. I like to resolve in my life, and I hope you would too, to be uh, like Jesus challenged Thomas to be not faithless but believing, John 20, 27. I'm here to tell you, God can if you ask the question, can God? God can. Yes, he can. We need to understand and recognize that. The God we serve is still the king of glory. He is still the king of kings, and he's able to do all the things he's ever been able to do. You may be asking, can God? And the answer rings loud and clear, God can. Now, let me ask you a series of questions. How many times has God come through for you? How many times has he moved the mountains that you needed moved and parted the waters in your life? How many times has he spoken peace to your storm? How many times has he met your need, done the impossible, proven himself to be God in your life? How many times? He's done it over and over and over for all of us. And yet we forget. We uh, A trial pops up or a difficulty comes in our way and we're dealing with some hard circumstances and the first thing we do is ask the question that Israel asked, can God... Yes, friend, God can. We need to take a look back and remember all the things God's done for us. Now, verse 13 through 15 of our text focuses on the defeat of Pharaoh at the Red Sea. And look at what the words say. Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for salvation with thine anointed. Thou woundest the head of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the neck. Thou didst strike through with his staves, the head of his villages. They came out as a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was as to devour the poor secretly. Thou didst walk through the sea with thine horses through the heap of great waters. Look at the verbs here. Thou wentest forth, thou woundest to strike and to devour and to walk. God did it. 
He gets the credit for everything that they were able to do. Now we see two things very clearly here. We see the utter defeat of those who oppose God, and we see God's resolve to do whatever it takes to deliver His people. Why is that important for us? Because many of us in our modern day do not have a God big enough for our modern problems. We, we think, somebody said the other day, I was listening to a message about, it was different, it was about giving and different things, but uh, he said a statement that made me think twice. But he said, sometimes we treat God and we pray as if God were broke. Uh, he, he doesn't have the ability to provide for our needs. And sometimes it comes in, in strength the same way. Like, God's not able to... I mean, we don't even pray about the circumstance. where It's too much for God to handle. It's just He won't be able to handle that. Our God's not big enough. If you had a bigger God, you wouldn't worry as much. If you had a bigger God, you wouldn't be, you'd be stronger in times of trouble. If we had a bigger God, we'd witness more. How big is your God? David defeated Goliath because his God was bigger than the giant was. See, and all the Israelites looked at Goliath, they trembled in their boots. They were, they were very fearful because Goliath was bigger than their God was, but not for David. David's like, who is this hipsqueak giant who thinks he can speak against God? Somebody ought to go out and take his head off. And he said, you know what? I'll do it. Actually, he was, said, I'll do it because he was just a boy still. And uh, he did it because his God was bigger than the giant. Gideon defeated the Midianites because his God was bigger than their army. Elijah called fire down from heaven because his God was bigger than all those uh, crowds of false prophets and compromisers. The size of your, listen to this statement, the size of your problem does not determine your victory or defeat. The size of God in your problem is what determines that. He's bigger than anything you face. And then we see his testimony. And this brings us to the end of the book. There's an acceptance. Look at verse 16. I trembled in myself, and I might rest in the day of trouble when he cometh up unto the people. He will invade them with his troops. Habakkuk accepts what is coming. And yet, what does he find? Rest in the day of trouble. Now, just look at that again. Let's read the verse again. Verse 16. It's the center of the verse. I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble when he cometh up unto the people. He will invade them with his troops. It almost seems sometimes I um, proofread my kids' reports for school. Um, my, if, if I reach for anything that has to do with math, my wife will slap my hand away. I can't touch the math, okay, because I don't know math, but... I will help with their reading and write because I do like words. And so when they write a report, sometimes I'll read the report and give some thoughts. And if I was reading this report, I would think, why don't you take out this uh, word that I might rest in the day of trouble because it doesn't fit there, does it? I trembled in myself. Look, well, let's read the whole verse. When I heard my belly trembled, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered into my bones, I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble when he cometh up with the people and invade them with his troops. doesn't seem like it fits in there, the rest in the day of trouble. Uh, we'll get to that in just a minute. But look at, look at just the, the, uh, the timeline here of the book, uh, or the, of this third chapter. Verse 2, he's praying, O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. What you did then, do again now. <clears throat> Keep on working. He knows there's going to be wrath and judgment, but God, remember mercy. The first thing he did was pray. The second thing he did was ponder. Verse 3 through 16 reviews the history of Israel and the wonderful works of the Lord. Habakkuk knew that God had worked in the past and he can do it again. The mountains tremble before the Lord and so uh, would the Chaldeans. And then thirdly, he praises. This is verse 17 through 19. Instead of complaining, which is something we all like to do, instead of complaining, he is praising the Lord. Can I tell you that God turns sighing into singing if we wait before him in prayer and listen to his word? Again, there, again, I'll tell you, there's no change in his circumstances. And I love this when we see an entire big shift in his attitude, even though the circumstances are exactly the same. Nothing has changed in that way, but yet he's now praising God. Oh my, if we, we always look for deliverance. That's what we want. 
Whenever we're in a problem, whenever we're in a bad circumstance, we, oh God, I want deliverance. And instead, God wants development. You want deliverance, He wants development. I wonder if we wouldn't be willing to let Him develop us if He wouldn't be able to deliver us sooner. Amen. But sometimes we have to stay in the problem longer because we're stubborn. Well, I'm not stubborn. Other people are. But uh, you know what I'm saying. That was a joke. Okay. If we could just get to the point of trusting God, no matter the situation. Helen Lyshad said this, Our circumstances are not an accurate reflection of God's goodness. Whether life is good or bad, God's goodness, rooted in His character, is the same. Ever had anybody, you ask somebody how they're doing, and say, God is good, when things are good? Guess what? When your world is falling apart, God is good. He's always good. And yet, and I do the same thing. If, if everything's going wonderful and, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm not hungry and I'm not sad and the sun's shining and it's not stinking February and things are good. And somebody asks, how are you doing? Boy, God is good. Well, he is good, but he's good when things are bad too. He's good when things are working against me. And we need not to use our circumstances to try to gauge whether or not he is good. And Habakkuk, that's the change that's taking place in his life. His attitude is no longer reflecting his circumstances. They're reflecting his God. And that's what we need to do. Verse 17, he describes a total economic meltdown. Israel was an agricultural society. Look what it says. The fig tree will not blossom. Fruit won't be in the vines. The labor of the olives shall fail. The fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold. There shall be no herd. Uh, this uh, this is a, being an agricultural society... This isn't just a random list. This is a portfolio. This is everything. Investments are gone. Pensions are gone. 401ks are wiped out. What do you do when you face that? What do we do if we lose our job? How do we respond if, we, if our safety net fails, if we run out of food, if we can't pay our bills, if the doctor says it's terminal, if we lose our job, uh, if we end up in jail for our faith or whatever? What then? Verse 18, look what it says. Yet, <laughs> I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. He has just listed perhaps the worst possible situation. There won't be any food. There won't be any money. There won't be anything to rejoice about. Yet, will I rejoice in the Lord. What a tremendous statement to make. This is the Old Testament version of Philippians 4.11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Habakkuk had seen the havoc that would be wrought by the enemy. Vineyards and olive groves and fig trees would be destroyed. Farms would be emptied. Yet will I rejoice in the Lord. And all of his doubts, uh, he was able to see that even though these bad things are happening, God is still on the throne. And he knows and trusts God. And he knows that there will be mercy in the place of all this. And so he is able to rejoice. He knew he had no strength of his own to resist this enemy, but that God would give him the strength he needed to go through. Look what he says. He will make my feet, this is verse 19, like hinds feet, and he will make me to walk upon high places. Too many Christians have the God of only the good times. Oh, they, everything's good. They trust God. Everything's fine, and, and God is good. But when the hard times come, if all you have is a God of the good times, then you don't have the God of the Bible. We don't want to be a fair-weather Christian, amen? We need to trust Him through everything. By the way, that's where you learn in the hard times. We all like the mountaintop. That's wonderful. When everything's going our way, we got the world by the tail, the bills are paid, the, the kids are obeying, and everything's going great. Uh, relationship with your mate's great, and everything's going... We like the mountaintop. But the valley is where things grow. Nothing grows on the mountaintop. It's a bunch of rock and snow and scrubs. Where, where things grow is in the valley. And where you will grow as a Christian life is in the valley. And so let's not get uh, upset when that happens. So faith chooses to believe when it would be easier to stop believing. And Habakkuk said, I will rest in the day of trouble. That's a tremendous statement. We need a proper perspective on troubles. A... Trouble is like, a, is like a pebble. If I, were, I didn't grab one, but if I were to go outside and pick up a little stone, 
tr our troubles are kind of like a little pebble. If I pull it all the way up in my eye and focus on it, I can't see anything else but that pebble because it blocks everything else out. And a lot of us do that when troubles come. That's all we focus on. Oh my, poor me because of my troubles. But if you hold it at a proper viewing distance, then it can be examined and properly classified. And if you throw it at your feet, you'll see it as true setting, just one tiny bump on the pathway to eternity. I'm just saying we've got to look at our troubles with the right perspective and not let them overcome us. Habakkuk found new strength in the midst of desolation. The last verse of Habakkuk is sometimes overlooked. Look what he says, The Lord is my strength. and He will make my feet like hind's feet. He will make me walk upon mine high places. The phrase, my feet here, speaks of our journey through life, speaks of deer, sure-footed, where the rest of us would slip and slide and eventually fall. And, and he's basically saying, if you know the Lord, he'll give you stability in the slippery moments of life. He'll give you the grace to stand when otherwise you would fall apart. He reminds us of Ephesians 6.13 where it says, put on the armor of God and having done all to stand. We can stand when those around us fall and that's, uh, that's because of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not in our circumstances, not looking at those, but putting our trust in him. And this is where the book ends, on a high note. And I want to repeat again the most important observation from this whole book of Habakkuk that as the book ends, nothing has changed on the outside. The people of Judah have still forgotten God. Violence still reigns. The wicked still oppress the righteous. And judgment is still coming. But Habakkuk has changed on the inside. And the same thing can happen for each and every one of us. Hard times are coming. And there's nothing we can do about it. In fact, here, you're in one of three places. You're either coming out of a difficult time or you're in difficult times maybe right now or you're about to go into difficult times you're welcome that's wonderful news isn't it but that's just life that's life we go through those times so take this challenge here from Habakkuk sometimes the answer is not to change our surroundings but to let God change us in the midst of our surroundings if we allow our circumstances to determine our happiness your life, your emotions are going to do this throughout your whole life. But if you let God and you put your faith in God and you say like Habakkuk, you know what, in the middle of all my troubles, I'm going to praise God for his, the, the God of my salvation. I'm going to put my trust in him. Then we'll be able to live a more even life. There'll be clouds of uncertainty. There'll be sadness. There'll be sickness. But if we know the Lord, our Savior, we can still walk in high places. And Jesus, somebody put it this way, you'll never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. And when Jesus is all you have, then and only then, you discover he is all you need. And that's really the message of the little book of Habakkuk. Uh, it, it mirrors much of our day. A lot of political turmoil, a lot of problems. Judgment is imminent. Look, we can't, God almost has to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah if he doesn't do something about America. Amen? I mean, we are, we're living in wicked times. And, but, but by the way, there are still righteous people here, praise the Lord. And that's why God's judgment is deferred, I believe. But, but uh, the, surely judgment will be coming. So what do we do about it? Well, we put our faith and trust in him. We certainly can't do it in circumstances. Have you, uh, do you have any friends or anybody in your life that's a total news junkie? Do you know anybody like that? And typically, they're completely emotionally wacko. They'll be up one day and down the other day. And just if their life focuses on what's in the news, they'll be an emotional basket case if they're listening to that. What we need is something more steady than that. Uh, we need to have something that we can depend on, someone we can trust, and that's him. And I encourage you to do that in your life. Don't let your circumstances determine your spiritual temperature. Amen? And that'll be a help. That's our lesson from Habakkuk. Let's have a word of prayer. In fact, why don't you stand along with me? We'll be dismissed in a word of prayer tonight and uh, appreciate you so much for coming out on a Sunday night. And I hope that that's a challenge.